I've been working on this collection for uh, 11 years now, which is a very long time in archivists' uh, lifetime and, and uh, work time. Um, so the project was set up in 2008, um, and uh, we're now uh, our eighth release was uh, on the 2nd of October, just passed, and we released uh, another 5,000 files uh, out for 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 research. Um, so. Tonight we're, because it's Monday, it's 8 p.m., you know, um, it's a heavy subject by just its nature, it's a complex collection, it's war, it's trauma, it's money, it's pensions, it's very local. Um, so what we're going to do is just going to have a look uh, at some documents together. And again, you guys, you, you know your locality, you will recognize the names and the local names of, of, of on, on these files, no, no question. I absolutely, I am not a historian for Offaly, so um, I hope, you know, that we can share stories, uh, maybe if you want to talk about uh, uh, your family or, or things like that at the end, I'll just take it all in. Um, so we sat now, again, Offaly was not Cork or Dublin or very hot, hot beds of, of activity, nonetheless, the files for Offaly are very different from the rest of, of the collection. Uh, and they're very interesting, and in them you can find things that are either uncommon in the rest of the collection, not standard, or uh, just, uh, you know, we'll see some sketches as well, and again, the standards uh, don't really apply for this collection, but the Offaly files really blow some of the files, other files out of the water completely. <coughs> um, for those who do not know the collection at all, we kind of sort of assume that by now, after 11 years of starting the work, some, most of the people who are usually coming to those talks know about the collection, but just to, and uh, so we're on the same page. The military service uh, pensions collection uh, and the project um, is one of the leading projects of the, uh, the Irish government's plan for the decade of, of, of centenaries. Uh, it's led by the Irish, uh, uh, the department, sorry, the Department of Defence, and it is supported by the Defence Forces. We are based in Caldwell Barks uh, since the beginning. And we have around 275,000 files, which is large, to say the least. Uh, in a nutshell, these records are the records of uh, applications lodged uh, by some 80,000 people for service pensions, um, uh, wound disease uh, pensions, gratuities, dependence pensions, uh, in respect of people who were part of the rising, the war independence and the civil war and who could uh, provide um, evidence of their uh, active service. I won't go into the definition of active service. If you want to actually have a good, a good look and maybe a good snooze as well, uh, go on the website. We have a ton of contextual information and the definition of active service is, is, is a little bit more difficult to grasp because it evolves between the rising and, and the rest of uh, the following events. I can say that the strength of the collection uh, resides in several aspects. First of all, you have a good representation of rank and file, which doesn't really happen with other collections like the Bureau of Military History, let's say. Um, people were targeted because of the place and the, the, the job they did back then. Here, you get the famous name, but you get everyone else as well, the local people, the ordinary people, and um, people who did not continue after the rising, or people who did not continue after the war independence, women, uh, and a lot of representation for women, which is really key for this, this collection. Uh, very unique files for, for uh, the active women uh, at the time. And then you also have a unprecedented representation for and high quality of evidence of networks, either through family ties, you can see clusters of family, you can see people with the same name. Uh, so, so, and it's easy to, is, easy to locate as well. Uh, but also through organizational structure, so within Kronemann, within the IRA. Um, um, and also, uh, for me, one of very interesting part of the collection uh, is that the files offer a really fresh possibility for an in-depth look um, at the Army Pensions Board procedures uh, that reveals the political and the legal uh, context of the time. <coughs> Here, uh, this is 1916, I'm in a role for, for Tullamore, not necessarily the best, uh, the best quality, but you can already see, you know, names like uh, Bracken, Brennan, uh, and the rest. So obviously, very that's very, very early on. There you go. Collection is a bit complex, so I decided to let you know where you were in the collection at any any one time. So. 
that's how it's structured roughly. You have that, those three big groups, individual claims, the membership with the brigade activity reports and the nominal roles and administration. I'm not going to talk about administration today, but we're going to talk about the brigade activity reports, a little bit about the nominal roles and how they inform us on the individual claims. Um, very roughly again, um, the brigade activity reports are the smallest, it, it's the smallest series in the collection with only 151 fires, which is not a lot, um, you know, compared to the, the, the extraordinary mass of the rest. But they really, um, they, they, they make up for it in the density of information that, that, that they contain, and we'll have, we'll have a better look at them. Um, a small overview for those who, you know, are researching awfully uh, proper, these are the files that are currently available. The, in the membership column, this won't change. We're not expecting any more files in those series. On the other hand, because the, the project is ongoing, um, this is what is currently available online uh, um, uh, for individual claims. So we have <coughs> 131 individuals with an address in County Offaly, and that includes 22 women. A bit of health warning here. Um, the fact that they have an address in Offaly doesn't always mean that they were always active in the county. They could have moved there after getting married for the women. They could have moved there at some stage. Uh, but roughly, the, this is what we have at the moment. Again, not finished, so this number will, will, will go up. And we're going to start with the brigade activity files. So um, we start with, with something that we, you can't actually have in many of the files that's, that you know, and Offaly has it, which is the, um, how the Brigade Committee uh, was constituted. Very briefly, um, it was uh, Humphrey Murphy, who was former officer commanding of Two Kerry Brigade, which is, uh, he's credited with uh, putting forward the idea uh, that Brigade Committees should be formed around the country to assist the verification of individual claims. So. Those fires, those brigade activity reports were created in the mid 30s, so quite a long time after, um, after the event and after people lodged their claims. Um, and they detailed uh, in chronologically uh, the listing of activities of the IRA and all the operations carried out uh, by the IRA throughout uh, 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 the country. Uh, so most of them focus heavily on the years 1920, 1921. Uh, but some of them and the Offaly fires do that, they go on and cover some part of the civil war as well. Again, that's not standard, so that, that's a very good thing to have in, in those fires. <coughs> um, the idea uh, for the creation of those fires uh, would be then it would be a convenient way um, to and a reliable uh, reference for the verification uh, of a service pensions claim. Uh, if Joe Soap say, okay, I was uh, in this ambush and I did that, um, well, it would be easy for the referee and the advisory committee, who were the two bodies uh, uh, um, uh, verifying the claims, to go to the brigade activity files and then get the listings of operation and see if Joe Soap was indeed part of that ambush. Um, so that how the idea was to, to do that. Again, um, it, many people emigrated, many people didn't want to talk about it anymore. Um, so it was it, it, very difficult to form those brigade committees from the start. And when it was formed, the fact that the demands on these brigade committees were always evolving, the goalpost was changing. So you have to provide us with the names for every single operations that you carried out. And then you have to provide us sketches. And then you have to provide more names for the supporting operations. So not the fighting operations, but people who blew bridges, people who blocked roads, uh, everything like that. So, um, and it's, it's apparent in the Offaly files that um, Sean Kelly had supplied already some records and the correspondence is basically, basically telling us, you have to provide us with enough. So you have to go back to, to, uh, to your brigade community and provide us so, some more. So it was very difficult, and this is why the files are so uneven as well. You don't get the same level of details uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the series. For instance, the files for Dublin are very poor. There's basically nothing in it but like newspaper cuttings and, and, and a couple of, of, of papers. Uh, obviously, Cork, very heavy, Kerry, very big. And we were half expecting Midlands to be very poor as well. Uh, and then we went to Offaly, and the files are actually very, very good. Uh, so we were very excited about that. And so again, for several reasons, you don't find sometimes the Brigade Committee constitution in the other files. And here you have that, obviously, again, 
uh, uh, some, uh, some you know, very famous names locally, uh, Guinness, Galvin, Egan, Dunn, uh, Scully, uh, McAvoy, and I recognize Birmingham, uh, Tom, Tom Birmingham as well, Mitchell, um, Brennan, another Dunn. So I, I suppose you guys must know all these names already and or it should ring a, it should ring a bell. Um, but this is what you have uh, on the left here. Um, this is uh, in both uh, Offaly Brigade files, so uh, one Offaly Brigade and two Offaly Brigade, and we are going to spend some time a little bit uh, on one Offaly Brigade in particular and the Tullamore Company uh, uh, in particular. Um, again, I said those, those files were uh, submitted by Sean Kelly, who was uh, at some point an a, a ex commanding officer of Tullamore Company and ex Brigade OC. Um, and this material uh, uh, lists some early activities of the brigade area. Again, that's, that's different from file to file, but in the Offaly file you find some 1916 uh, uh, activities which you don't find in many other files. Um, and, that's one. and on the right here, this is part of the nominal roles, and these are the li company listings for uh, the 1st Battalion. You can see Tullamore, Gertin, is it Killy? Balikar? Yes. Uh, Buddy Colin, yeah. Kim Bacon, Brad Clinton, and Duro. Um, so first critical date, that's very important. Um, again, take those figures with a pinch of salt as well. That's, that's, that's not 100%. Sometimes we have three sets of different figures uh, for, for each company. So, you know, uh, to, to, to cross-reference with other sources. And so, so be aware of that. What's very important, though, is the separation between the first critical date and the second critical date. Your first critical date is the 11th of July, 1921. So we take for granted that, that those, uh, uh, those first set of numbers are for the war independence. And the second critical date is the 1st of July, 1922, taken as the start of the Civil War. So the second set of figures is uh, Civil War figures. Now, this is the overall number for the company, but in the file, you will find the listings with the names, all the names for the first critical date, all the names for, for the second critical date, which allows you to compare and how many people went pro-treaty, basically, um, compared to whoever was uh, involved in war independence. So it's kind of amazing. I mean, like, I'm used to it now, but I'm still finding it kind of... Uh, uh, kind of amazing. It's really important for common man, for instance. Uh, we know that Republican women, uh, mo most of the women went uh, uh, pro-treaty after after the truce, but many of them dropped out, not because they went anti-treaty, but they got married. And from the moment they got married, then they completely dropped from, from, from our radar. Now you're here. That's the first page of the uh, um, uh, one Offaly Brigade activity. So first battalion, second battalion, third, fourth, and fifth. And you can see here, uh, handed in by Sean Kelly today, with the date for the fifth of something, 1940. Um, that's how it starts. And we start with 1916, which is, again, quite rare to have that on file. And straight away you're you're into Brennan and Bracken, so that's basically the names that are obviously going to come back and again and again. Uh, Bracken takes part in the Rising in Dublin, uh, it says that here. Uh, and in the same year, he's appointed uh, on the executive of the Irish Volunteer, and he serves on that uh, until 1921. Uh, then serves as well as commandant of one Offaly Brigade from 18 to 1920. And then is appointed as an organizer for parts of Tipperary, Kildare, uh, and Offaly as well. Um, and his file, his file is, is, is quite good. Uh, he's arrested in 21, escapes in October, and then joins the Home Department, uh, the Home Affairs Department, Dol Aaron, um, helping to organize a Republican courts. Um, has no uh, real um, Civil War service as such. Again, his name along with others. We, we're going to find them all, all over the place, like the McGuinness, the Galvin, Barry, Pauline. Um, what is really good in those files is that you have those early activities. So you can see 
activities 1917, 1918 is the preparation. So you have a lot of raids for arms, looking for munitions, uh, a lot of a lot of arm uh, arms and weaponry being moved from places to places. And as you can see, all those raids, see like raids on Captain Briscoe, uh, residence raid in Old Station, a rifle procured from a British soldier. And you have two pages from 1917 of little bits like that. But it's little bits, but it's the first time those names are attached, attached to those activities, which is very significant. Um, but you can see those activities necessitate only two people, three people, four people max, and you can see from 1917 and then you go into 1920, the list of people for each activity is, is increasing, grows and grows and grows, and gives you an, a, kind of an idea of the, 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 um, the size of, of the operation. 1918, still early, but again, uh, uh, you can see mold for pellet, bullet making, cartridge loader procured, Large multiple pellet making and made handed to company by again Sean Kelly is here. Um, general collecting, raiding for arms, and um, I'll come back to the one in the middle. Raid for arms, raid for arms, pages of raid for arms basically. But we find something already very interesting that, and again, the Alpha fighters just are such a gift because due to their nature, they only relate to the guys. It's only about the IRA, so there is very little reference to women in those fires at all. <coughs> but sometimes, and we'll zoom in, it's there, very easy to miss. <coughs> this is Melidi. Um, during 1819, at the home of the Melidi family at Ballydaly, Tullamore, thousands of lead pellets were run, and thousands of rounds of sporting cartridge were refilled and stored by Peter Bracken, <coughs> Martin Melidi, the Mrs. Melidi, uh, in dump near Melidi's home. So I really want to find those Melidi women, um, but they probably got married and they're probably not named Melidi anymore. So how am I going to find them? And that's how we do as catalog, as good catalogger. Uh, obviously, we record maiden name, married name, and everything is searchable. Thank God for that. So uh, I looked for uh, Martin first. As you can see, I'm, I'm only putting the dates there because it's amazing. Um, he's born in 1895. He gets, his, he gets a, a, a service pension. Um, the fire that stays open for as long as the person is alive, because they need to prove that they're still alive to get their money. It sounds quite you know, uh, natural. But he dies in 1990. You have like Martin's life over like from the moment he applies in the 30s to 1990. So, I mean, from a social point of view and the kind of information you find, it's, it's quite something. Um, so it, it was just to give an indication on, on you know, how, how some, some fires are st were still open in 2000. Um, so I'm looking for Martin, and Martin, there's a reference in Sean McGuinness fire that described the Melidi family home, which was situated about 1.5 miles from Tullamore, as a rendezvous for the founders of the IRA movement in North Offaly, as well as for the officers, staff, and men carrying on the fight from 1916 to 1924. So that's also very significant to know that. And Martin is an important enough figure um, because he provides references for many uh, often claimants as well. He's very active during the war of independence and the civil war. He takes an anti-treaty position. You know that because he has an MSP 34 ref. That means pretty much you can be pretty much sure that he was anti-treaty. People who went pro-treaty have a 24 SP file because they were able to apply 10 years earlier. Um, that's when we talked about it today, the discrimination. You don't find discrimination in the file. There's not a lot of politics. I mean, Dan Breen got, gets a pension. That's, that's the level, yeah. So the, but on the other hand, the discrimination is through the legislation. 1924, uh, uh, you know, the, anti, anti, uh, the pro-treaty side gets uh, to take care of, it, of itself. And, and only in 1934, 10 years later, two years after the Fianna Fáil government is in power, uh, suddenly, the legislation opens up to anti-treaty so anti-treaty troops and the women of Kuno. So Martin, um, he takes part in the attack on Clara uh, R. C. Barracks um, and then many other, th uh, other things as well. And he wrote on the 20th of June 1934 that the RA units were, I quote, <coughs> after putting in the end wall with a mine, I, with three comrades, went back and was in the act of setting fire to the place when they opened fire on us. K 
killing Patrick Seary and wounding myself and Mr. Fleming and E. Brennan. So um, you know now that Mar uh, Martin uh, received a gunshot wound and shrapnel wounds in the left forearms and his forehead. He was admitted to the Matter Hospital uh, in Dublin under the name Thomas Murray. And you find all of that in the file, uh, which is amazing. And he was discharged in June 1920. And then he has, a, um, uh, he has an extraordinary story. He was arrested by the British forces in December 20 and sentenced to 18 months hard labor, of which nine months were remitted. And claims that he, uh, he later claimed that he served uh, time in jails in Montjoy, in Perth, Scotland, uh, in Glasgow. And upon his release in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, sorry, it's part of my description, of course, uh, in Glasgow, uh, he states that he set sail to Dublin, but his boat was involved in a collision with another boat, and he spent two hours in the water with a life belt. Where would you get that? I mean, oh, maybe locally you know. Did you know the story of the boat? When you find that in the files, it's like, God, this is amazing. This is, this is really what you want. Um, and again, so then he takes the message to decide once he's rescued. Uh, text, uh, oh yeah, he further claims that he never received any compensation from his steamship company, uh, so he tried, <laughs> and which is cool. Uh, and I find so Mary Ann Tracy, Tracy uh, his sister, she's a trained nurse, captain of the Betty Daly branch of Kumanamon. Mon. Um, her uh, war independence activity is very well recorded in the files, and she meets tons of people. She sheltered RA men on the run, including Seamus Robinson, Sean Tracy, Sean Hogan, Dan Green, uh, for a whole month. She makes munitions, so we know the house is pretty much the munition-making house of the area, so she does that a lot. Um, and Ellen, uh, that's her sister, pretty much the same activity. So I suppose that the Mrs. Malidi were Mary and, and Ellen. Um, so it's just to show you that from that little snippet, you have three stories and then linked to activity to a, a man that is now dead or at that stage. And you can see the one D233, D would uh, you know, be either uh, wound or dependence, or see someone claim on his behalf because, uh, uh, in respect of his death. Um, so just from those like five or six lines, you, you can link it to individual files uh, and get more stories. Something that you know about Ellen as well, it says that on the file, um, on one okay, it's not, and it's not on Mary and Tracy files for some reason, although because they have the same activities. Uh, on one occasion, um, after the attack on Sergeant Cronin, um, 10 RM men came to the house with wet clothes, having waded through a river to escape. Uh, and she states that she fed all of them, dried their clothes, and she claims that she visited prisoners as well in Tullamore jail, uh, taking messages. <coughs> Uh, and when her brother Martin was arrested and sent to England, she took over the running of the farm all by herself. So again, all on file. Here you have 1920. Again, that's, that's really good for Offaly because you don't find the ASU activities in all the files as well. So here you have like really good indication of how busy they were and what they were doing. And I like this page because uh, as you can see, it really gives you an indication of who's still around, who's deceased, and who emigrated as well. So it's very easy to see, um, you know, here to the more USA, USA, deceased, USA, deceased, deceased, Tullamore, Dublin. So it would be very easy to have a look at those names, take them down, and then search for individual files and, and, and have a look at their stories. But just for that, uh, I think it, the nominal roles and the brigade activities usually uh, have uh, what you know the address and what became of them. And if you find uh, NT in the files, I mean no trace. So usually um, no files at that stage could be found for the applicants. That doesn't mean there there isn't any. But um, um, that precise one on the nine, on the eleventh of November, nineteen twenty, the ASU column carried. Uh, uh, carried out an attack on the towns in a place known as a range wall, Rahim uh, Ishil. Uh, obviously, you can imagine that was, you know, he's healing my way through uh, the files for a long time. Um, again, uh, the files for Offaly are superb in that regard, is that they have sketches. And not only they have sketches, they have really good sketches. And that's just, uh, that's just a detail from, from, uh, from that Rahim uh, attack. And not only they have sketches, but they have also 
a narratives, narrative attached to all the sketch. So you have, it's actually a drawing book, it's like that size, you know, kind of landscape size. And uh, you have, you open, you have your first map and you have an explanation of what happened. And then you have a second sketch and you have, you know, it's, it's brilliant. And some files really don't have that. So here for uh, the, so again, as you, if you remember, it said 11th of November, 1920. And already on the narrative, it says the 12th of November, 1920. So, you know, you have to be careful with the dates. Um, an ASG column was formed on the night of the 1st of November from men mobilized to counteract reprisals after the shooting of certain Cronin RC in Tullamore. The mobilization center was Anneville, Rahin, Gishil, and after citing a suitable position for an ambush and waiting some days, some days, not just like, you know, oh, some days they waited, for the enemy to pass, eventually, a lorry of tans came from the direction of Port Arlington about uh, at 3 p.m., which the ASU opened fire on. The tans returned the fire, which was kept up for about 10 minutes by both parties. The ASU suffered no casualties. From information received from the RRC barrack maid, the barrack maid, I want to look for her now, because I need her <laughs> to tell me more stuff. There were three casualties as a result of the engagement. And then remarks, so this was, this was the only position of the, in this area suitable for an ambush. But for the attack to be successful, the enemy would have to be traveling from Tullamore direction. Um, so this, you know, I like that because it really gives you a really good insight on, on, on what they were doing. Um, as you can, you, I don't know if you can see there, um, A, B, C, D, and E are basically where the, where the men were positioned. And it's just laid out here for us to have a look at. A to B, position of the main body of the ASU with 13 men. C was a position with two men, D was a position with one man, E, four men, F, one man, and one man with Red Cross was left at the headquarters. And you, you don't get that anywhere else, really, um, that I know of. But then again, I'm really open to correction any time. I, I mean, some of them are really <coughs> full of explanation and full, full of details, and you need to spend a bit of time with them. Like I said, another amazing feature of the Offaly files, uh, the Brigade Activity files for Offaly, is that they go on to cover uh, the Civil War. Not standard at all in the files. Um, and here you can see several interesting operations. And one in particular draws a strange parallel with what can happen currently around the country, if you uh, have a look at it. The armed raid on Osterbank, carried out by the 3rd Southern Division. Tullamore men engaged included Michael Galvin, Edward Brennan, Patrick Egan, John Hughes, Christy Tyrell, James Whelan, now USA, as outpost. The manager was fatally wounded, and McMahon, the engineer, failed to blow open the safe and was removed from the building and taken to Crinkle Barracks by Army Fender. Um, I like the stories like that. It makes me, it makes me, um, reminds me of people just taking the ATMs out of the wall. You, know, just, you can't open it, you just take it with you. <laughs> um, Again, 1922, uh, sniping and military patrol, attack on free state troops in Kilbega, uh, at Kilbegan Bridge. Um, uh, these are interesting names now, Vickers, Kilevi. Um, just keep that in mind. Vickers, I have troubles, troubles to find his files because Vickers uh, is not spelled like that. It's V-I-C-A-R-S. So that, that caused me trouble, unfortunately. <laughs> but I found him eventually. Um, after month of November 1922, preparations were made for an attack on Free State military lorry. So it goes on, it goes on for another for another uh, couple of pages after that. Probably, um, well, I think, um, again, open to correction, largest operation in terms of participation are usually attacks on RRC barracks. Here, I think it lasts for two, two, three pages, um, oh, a list of RA members involved in, not only in the attack on the 1st of November 1920, but in the supporting activities, so blocking roads, blowing up stuff, all in relation to that attack. And you have two pages full of names. Um, again, to me, it, 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 it's so good because we could have just the 10 names over there, but certainly we have names of 20, 30, 40 people attached to, to an activity, and we, we didn't know any, any of this before. Um, 
So again, familiar names, you can find Melidi, uh, Bracken, uh, Barry, Kiliby, Poland as well. Um, and the list goes on for um, where they were based, where they were positioned, who were scouting for them, men at lock, and, and again, plenty of uh, uh, page next. Good sketch for Tullamore. Um, and that sketch is actually used for two operations on file. One is the uh, 1st of no November 20. It says here, as a reprisal for the death of Lord Mayor of Cork, an attack was planned on the most prominent of the RRC who had to deal with the criminal and political side of their duties. In Tullamore RRC barracks, two men were picked out and a number of our men detailed off to deal with them. To deal with them. Sergeant Cronin left his house to return to barracks at 7 p.m. and he was dealt with by, at point shown in Henry Street by Sean Barry, Sean Levy, both of Tullamore. The other RSC men, uh, man returned to barracks at about 10 or 15 minutes earlier than usual and so escaped. Remarks, a large number of men were mobilized at a place called Round Lock, about one mile from town to counteract any reprisals by RRC or TANS, but the man who had custody of the guns was held up in Tullamore after the shooting of Sergeant Cronin, and it was too late to do any good when he got cleared. Results, one RRC killed. So they used the same map for an, an operation uh, undertaken on the 1st of April. No. Uh, on the 1st of April, 1921, um, and again, the explanation is about half a page. You could spend like your know, days on, on, on those sketches uh, and learn a bit more. And sketches are very good, they're very detailed. Uh, some sketches that we have on Paz are very basic, with basically two roads intersecting and I was there on the cross and he was killed here. And, and that's basically it. So those, those are actually very, very, very good for the files. In the operations led by, uh, by uh, um, one of the brigade, one battalion, and in particular to Lamore, you have also stuff like that. Uh, execution, arrest, trial, execution of spies. I found a couple. One, uh, Stedman, Steedman. Um, the following dealt with the affair. It's always dealt with. We dealt with it. You know, it doesn't really tell you uh, uh, the gory uh, part, but we dealt with it. And these are the men who dealt with it. And the following carried out the execution of student man, uh, Sean McGuinness, James McGuinness, John Horan, William Ryan, Rind? Ryan, uh, William Piggott. Now I wanted to know if Sean McGuinness was uh, talking about it in his file. Uh, again, that's not the best quality, but actually the, 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 the document itself is poor quality, so it's not the scan, it actually kind of looks like that. And I could find the one reference there. Killing of Spy, Stidman, on 9th of July, 1921. I don't know if it's the correct date, actually, because I found two or three different dates. So, again, dates are uh, hit and miss. So you can see, I mean, how, how the files relate to each other. If you go through the Brigade Activity Files, maybe the first thing you should do is to go to the individual files and see if what they talk about in the Brigade Activity Reports are in, in tune with what the claimant says he did as well. Um, okay, now, um, if you got the uh, revolution files, uh, that, that um, the Irish Times supplement that was issued on Tuesday this week, um, um, uh, police work is talked about. Um, police work is three pages in that file, which is quite a big, uh, quite a big file, it's three pages. You could just go through them and not really see anything until you really stop and just have a look. That is not found in the other files at all either, or it's referred to, but it's not broken down so clearly uh, that way. Um, so it's quite a document. Uh, it details police work undertaken by the RA in the locality, solving issues, uh, solving local issues through fines, arrests, Detention, deportation, or all of that at the same time. And here you can see arrest of men for stealing goods of all kinds, stealing bicycles, uh, stealing uh, uh, you know supplies uh, of of, kind, of any kind. I think some people even uh, stole bales of, of, of wheat as well. Um, so um, they get arrested. Uh, uh, many arson, uh, cases of arson as well. 
Um, so again, you can see roundup of criminal gang, uh, following complaints from different places for robbery, following were taken into custody. So you have the names of, of, of civilians, and we don't find names of civilians really in the files. This is very rare. Um, court martial, uh, and, and again, well, some of them are uh, RA, um, uh, RA members, so they're taking care of themselves, basically. Court president over by Bertie Byrne. I just found his files. I haven't uh, cataloged it yet. With captains Sean Scully, Sean Kelly, and another, his name forgotten. <coughs> we'll forgive him that because we have so much already. After nearly six hours sitting, uh, all were found guilty, and fines were imposed on John Phelan and of the others. Uh, all, the, all the others were found guilty. Yeah, yeah, found and of the others, Gory was acquitted. Frank Phelan gave an undertaking to clear out. All were released by giving an undertaking for their future good behaviour. Those engaged in the, their roundup and custody included those people. Uh, and that, that next one, DW uh, robbery, Williams robbery, a series of raids were committed on Mr. Williams' wholesale store. I wonder what the people were looking for. Um, <laughs> and Williams offered a reward of £100 to the local Larry company if they could clear up the affair. Let's clear up the affair, shall we? Uh, well, Michael Keevy, <laughs> tell more, was put on the job. And when the affair, the affair was cleared up, Mr. Williams handed over the cash to local company for arms fund. Uh, you don't find that in the other files, very rarely. This is pure, pure local. This is really good. Uh, again, you see errors of, of X for arson, and you, and you have a lot of that. And again, the name of Michael Keevy will rise above the rest a little. Um, he was appointed company intelligence officer in 2021 and later promoted to battalion police officer. And as such, he was exempt from drilling, from doing the routine stuff. Uh, so he, he was a uh, proper um, intelligence, but he, he got um, uh, engaged in kind of more shoddy and dodgy stuff as well. Asylum cases, I had never found that in any other files before. I remember took, uh, took it upon themselves to have several men committed as well, escorting them to Mary Borough Asylum, uh, so um, Mary Borough's Porkish. Um, the following were committed to Mary Borough Lunatic Asylum. Patrick Cosgrove, early in 1919, was taken into custody by Michael Whelan, John Dunn, and Matthew Keane, and conveyed by them to Mary Borough Asylum. They have six names, Michael Roy, you have six names of people who were who were committed, um, but also Michael Roy Bracken conveyed to Maryborough Asylum by Michael McDermott and Patrick Malloy, who were themselves arrested and sentenced to eighteen months imprisonment. So, um, so you get several stories in one there. The gamble arrests for robbery is well known as well. Nineteen nineteen. Um, I haven't used it in my presentation. It's just, it's just so much, um, but we can have a look. A second of the public street. And as he was in the company of a good many of his own who were a very rowdy crowd and might put up a fight, especially picked body of IRA and Republican police were detailed off to secure him, which they did. He resisted violently and did considerable damage to the car he was put in after arrest. And then you have all the names of people who, who were linked to that, uh, to that thing. I think he was deported. He was basically, um, a ticket to England was, uh, was uh, purchased for him. We can have him. Um, the Agatha Christie of the of the, the file for me, the robbery in Colton's hotel. I don't know where it was Colton Hotel. Okay. Mary Fox was arrested by Mary Jane McBrien and Bridget Mooney Kumanman for the robbery of watches, jewelry, <coughs> all stuff recovered and returned to the truce. Fox tried and expelled from the area. Several Iron men were wrongly arrested by Crown forces over the arrest of Fox Girl. I mean, that that reads like it should be in a movie or something, or some sort some sort of a crime novel. <laughs> that's pretty good. Again, I mean, you don't find that anywhere else. That that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty good. And again, a, a story that was uh, that was uh, um, taken for uh, the revolution file was the rounding up of undesirable girls cutting their hair and chaining them to railings. Um, um, I, I found that very, very quickly. So it's, it's rare to find in the files, but we know it's not rare. It, it did happen. And I think Dermot Ferrier talks a lot about that as well. 
But when I looked at the names, I only looked at Poland and Spain, I was like, oh my god, they're using fake names to cover <laughs> But no, um, <laughs> just for half a second, I was like, why are the country names? This is the thing. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so this week I tried to find their files. I have now Martin Poland as well as his wife, who was in Kuhn Mom. I couldn't find Spain, I couldn't find Gabriel King, but I found Cleavy along with his brothers, Vickers and Dempsey, and obviously none of them talk about that. I don't think Dempsey talks about police work undertaken in a very rough general way, but obviously they don't, uh, they don't relate the, the incident. Now we jump there, we're going to see the individual claims very quickly. Um, just because I wanted to go to Burr today to the castle to see the plaque for the three area men that were uh, shot and uh, executed by firing squad in January 1923 with Conroy, uh, Cunningham and Kelly. Um, I believe their age is wrong on the plaque, I'm told. I think Kelly might have been way younger than what the plaque says, but they were around their, their 20s and Kelly was much younger than that, I think. And this is the, uh, the death search for Patrick uh, uh, Cunningham. Um, the dependence fires take, uh, are, have a very special place, I think, for us in the collection because without the dependence fires, the dead have no voice. Obviously, they can't apply for service pension, they're dead. So, uh, how do we know about them? We know about them through people who were either completely or partially financially dependent on these people. Um, so mothers apply, sisters apply, uncles, uh, cousins, so many people change their arms as well. Uh, obviously you're very, you know, for a very lost cousin is not financially dependent on, on, the, on an 18 year old boy who just dead, you know. So uh, things like that. Before these three, um, their mothers, their mothers apply Elizabeth Conroy of Brides Lane, Bark Street. Bridget Cunningham, Rocana Street, and Rose Cavill um, from Upper Barrack Street. They apply in respect of the loss of their sons, um, and, they, and, and they have to prove that they've been financially or partially financially dependent uh, uh, um, uh, towards them. So one of them, um, each one of them, sorry, was awarded a partial dependence gratuity of 112 pounds. It's a, it's a one-off payment, and that's, that's what they got. I'm not going to go into the story because I think you, you know, you're, you're, you're local, you know exactly the story and were arrested for possession of firearms and uh, for having raided uh, uh, some residences and looting uh, various places. Um, so this is a, a, a Bridget Cunningham's uh, notice for £112 that she got. Um, I think for, for um, Rose Cavill, in respect of, uh, of Colin Kelly, it says that she got paid 112, <coughs> but it doesn't say really if she got the money. It says the, the, the 112 pounds was recommended, but there's no evidence that, that uh, she got it. Uh, dependence files, <coughs> in fact, so good that I just, uh, I didn't have to dig. I was like, I just want to show them an interesting stuff from the dependence files. They have so much social history, the dependence files, because they have to prove they were financially dependent. How do you prove that you're being means tested? And the means testing comes with a lot of information about where you live, who's in the house, where, what's your income, what kind of land do you have, do you have cattle, how do you live? Um, and here, this it's a little snapshot. Again, I didn't have to dig, it was like just there for me. Hustle that time, and just imagine if you're, you know, researching social information on the files, what, what kind of information you get. Hustle at the time of death of deceased Rose Cahill, who's the applicant. Hustle, she's doing hustle duties for that, uh, that amount per week um, from her, she gets that from her husband's pension. Colin Kelly, earnings and contribution at 10. Joseph Kelly, 12 years old. Charles Kelly, 8 years old. Christina Kelly, 12 years old, obviously unemployed. Uh, Clayman's first husband, Joseph Kelly, died in 1914. She later married William Cowell, who at the time was a distillery worker, and um, two pounds per week. She states that he became unemployed soon after the marriage, and in 1916 he joined the British Army, serving in the Great War until 1918. During this period, the claimant was in receipt of the 17 shillings, 
per week, separation allowance in respect of herself and her children. Subsequent to 1918, her second husband was in receipt of a service pension, <coughs> together with allowances for the children until they reached the age, the age of 16. She is unable to state the amount of such allowances. Claimant states that her husband was eccentric and that after a couple of years he left the family and went from place to place as a traveling musician until his death about 11 years ago. During this period, the claimant received three shillings per week from his serious pension. She states that he did not reside with her at the time of her son's death. I am of opinion that the claimant was only partially dependent on the deceased at the time of his death. It would be reasonable to assume that her husband made some contribution to her upkeep. So you find things like that, which like really blows everything out. Suddenly you have a first husband who went to war, a second husband who was an eccentric musician. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, again, you start from trauma and, and a like, horrible case of, of young guys being, uh, being executed. Uh, and then, but, but in there you find so much more information than what you were, uh, you know, um, uh, starting from or intending to find. And this is really good as well. This is a letter from uh, Sean uh, McGuinness, which is on file. He writes from Kinity. Kelly had direct to go off, uh, off the run and go home owing to his youth, so we know he's super young. Cunningham and Conroy were suspended for a breach of discipline, so they were kind of, kick, you know, they were kind of pushed away from from uh, 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 their their units for a breach of discipline arising out of some minor offence. That two of the brigade officers of the time whom I have got in touch with cannot recollect. While on suspension pending court-martial, both of them with Kelly were arrested and later executed arising out of charges that can be traceable through your records at that time. Again, I must say that it was savage punishments inflicted on three youths <coughs> considering their offenses <coughs> and the horrible crimes that were committed by people on the other side who were never brought to justice. That gives you kind of the tone of um, for, for this uh, event in particular from Sean McGuinness. Like I said, the, the, um, I wish I had more files for the women for tonight, um, but I did find them, some of them anyway, but I didn't have the time to catalog them, but they will be released uh, early next year, so something to look uh, forward to. Um, at the moment, don't say anything stupid, at the moment I think we have 1, 000, more than 1,700 applications lodged by women, uh, which is extraordinary because 10 years ago we only knew the name of maybe you know 90 women from 1916. Um, so I mean that area of research is going to explode and I can guarantee you in the next few years, especially when it comes to the service of women in the civil war, this is going to be the big, big focus uh, for, for the next few years. The, uh, you know, women, war independence and civil war, especially civil war is just so uh, not well known. And um, those fires are going to be an open door uh, to, to, to research uh, women roles and women's activities of the time. I found Mrs. McCormack, obviously. Um, I start from their married name and um, because they, most of the time when they reply, they are already married. So that's, that's easy enough to find. Uh, so I found a, a um, um, presence, okay, hopefully district council mirrors the battalion and then the, um, the squads are kind of mirroring RA companies, so that's how they work. They are mirroring the structure at a much lower uh, level, obviously. Uh, so Mrs. McCormack here is uh, president of the whole district council at both uh, War Independence Day and Civil War date as well. Uh, Saint Mrs. Uh, Paulin, uh, adjutant or secretary. Uh, you can probably assume that both of them were taking care of, 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 of being treasurer as well, um, because there's no name for treasurer there. Um, and then underneath that, again, that's, that's, uh, that form is standard, but you don't find him, uh, you don't find it a, a very, a very uh, you know, on the, uh, all the time. But we have that one for the Offaly District Council. And then for Tullamore, you would have the strength of that. You start from uh, 109 members uh, for Tullamore uh, Squad, and then you drop at 51 for, for the Civil War, so massive drop. Again, that doesn't mean that only 51 women went pro-treaty, at least 51 women went pro-treaty, but you can say that some of them probably just dropped completely uh, from, from the map and just um, uh, got married. Um, I can't find Bridget Mooney, but I can find her husband who applies from the States. So he applies and he gets it, but she doesn't apply at all. Um, 
And you can see here Captain uh, Marion Tracy, who is in, now we know she's the sister of Martin Bellini, uh, and she was captain of the Buddy Daily branch. Uh, I'm looking for Katie Larkin at the moment, and this is Egan. Um, there's so many Egans in the file as well, I'm not quite sure who she's married to. Um, Condren, Dempsey, so we have Dempsey files, so I should find her. Uh, Bridget Brady, she died, so presumably never applied. Holly Plunkett, never heard of her before either. Um, so, so I have a little bit of, of more work to do on that, but um, of all the files I found, I can say that only, for now, only <coughs> Mrs. McCormack was successful in her application. And I, here resides the problem for the women. It's just, if you're not captain, or if you're just a member, it's very hard. If you're Dublin and Cork, you have probably more opportunity to be active in terms of dispatches and, uh, you know, lending your, you know, and, uh, putting your hat at the disposal of the IRA or the flying column or something like that. It's much harder for them to uh, apply and be successful in, in a geographical area where less things happen. Uh, so that's, that's just a um, matter of fact. Uh, this, I'm going to finish with that. Um, Bridget Weir, uh, Weir, Weir. Um, Michael, you, you, knew, you knew the name, but some, some people know the name, some people don't. Um, I still have to research her a little bit. I don't know what she did in her, in her later, li later life, but anyway. Um, in her file, we know that she was involved from 1918, and she said she took the oath of, in 1920. Again, taking the oath for women is not exactly standard either, so, uh, or they're not saying it in the file. She lived with her mother, who had a licensed premises next door to the RRC barracks in Tullamore. Um, and she, <laughs> this is funny, um, no, it's, sorry, it's not funny, it's not, it's not <laughs> always haha, but um, she lived near the RSC barracks, which she later assisted in burning. This is the thing. Her house was used for meetings by several volunteers, including Paddy Egan, Tom Malone, Ned Brennan, uh, Michael Galvin, and she, her house was uh, uh, used as headquarters by Ernie O'Malley as well. And throughout the war in the she was mainly involved in intelligence gathering due to her house being so close to the RC barracks, and obviously she was looking at uh, uh, movement uh, and things like that, and she was uh, informing the, the, the RRA. Um, not only that, but uh, she was gathering information through her close relationship with Sergeant John Curran's wife, who lives in the barracks. And quite, quite extraordinary, again, awfully keeps on giving, and I can't find that, that those kind of letter anywhere else. Sergeant Curran writes this letter for, in support of her uh, application form. It's, uh, yeah, the handwriting is crazy, so I'm just going to read it. I, the undersigned, was RSC sergeant in Dengen, awfully Dengen, <coughs> all during the period of the fight for Irish freedom. I wish to state that Mrs. Veer of Dengen, awfully, went through a very trying time, particularly during the Black and Tan regime. Her house was on several occasions raided with a view to arrests of IRA men whom she kept from time to time in her home. Information was conveyed to uh, the authorities, to my authorities, on numerous occasions in connection with her activities with the result that I was requested to oppose her hints. And make a full report of the matter to my authorities. This I did, but I denied that she was offering shelter to these men, though I knew perfectly, I knew perfectly well she was in fact doing so. On the grounds owing, uh, of my report, the matter of action with regard to her and hence was allowed to drop for the time. Through her activities, she conveyed information several times about impending raids and arrests with the result that when, she, we, when we arrived at such place, everybody had gone. Um, that is really rare. It's a really rare find uh, uh, for, for the type of files that we're dealing with. Uh, and that, that makes her file completely, uh, completely uh, unique. Um, so that's just really a very quick overview of what you can do with the files and how they connect with each other and the type of information you can find. Um, I'm looking forward to dig into all the books that was given today about the locality and, um, and you know, knowing a lot more about Offaly. Um, so I'll take any questions that you have, bearing in mind that you know, I give talks in like 32 counties, so I can't be a hundred percent on, on every, every single one of them are historian and just presenting the primary sources for you guys to um, um, push that further. So if you have any questions you can follow us um, on Twitter. This is uh, 
uh, our MSP, uh, we call it MSP blog on Twitter, and we release all, all kinds of information. Um, we have a blog as well. So the blog for us, uh, you can search the collection, obviously we're releasing everything through the Military Archives website. You can find um, um, the blog for us is, is kind of a, is an area where we can write things about the files that we're, uh, we're going through. So if we find something that sticks out, that's out of the ordinary, uh, that we find that we should highlight this and we, we have nowhere else to do than, than you know, write a small article and inform people, hey, we found, we found that, you know, some of you might find that interesting. Um, so it's kind of a freedom area for the archivists to kind of highlight uh, interesting uh, bits. And Twitter, which is, we relay that uh, on social media a lot. Um, so thank you again so much for coming here on a Monday, on a Monday evening. Um, I hope you, uh, you can appreciate the, 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 the range of, of, of the material where we're trying to, uh, to, to put out. Um, again, if you have questions, I'm very happy to, to answer anything, if I can.